Well, there's a principle taught here in the Scripture. It's in the Bible. Over in the book of Matthew, God's Word says, For unto every one that has shall be, shall be given, and he shall have abundance. It goes on to say that he that does not have, to what he has will be taken away. Anything he has will be taken away from him. We have little that will be removed from us. But if we've received, we've received from the hand of God, we've applied it, and we've received back in abundance, God says, I will do a great thing. For everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But to the man or the woman that did not give himself and apply himself or herself, it will be taken away. They may not have much to start with, but what they have will be removed. It will be taken away. I'm asking today, do we know this principle? Because many Christians stop after conversion. They're frozen in their beginning state. To what extent are we aware of a desire for God himself and a knowledge of the glory of God? Moses is not, is not asking for a particular blessing. He's done that, but he does not stop there. He's now seeking God for himself. So many Christians are asking for a blessing. Lord, I want this. I, I, oh, they see God using some man or woman over there and they want that. Oh, God, I want to be like that. I, I want that blessing. I want that experience with God. But Moses here is getting past the experience, experiences with God and asking for particular blessings and asked to know God himself, to see his glory. This is the way God wants us. Do we know anything of such a longing? Psalmist cried in Psalm 42, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God Himself. And that's what He wants, the living God Himself. And that's why He pants and thirsts. That's why He's so hungry for God. He wants God Himself. He's not asking for blessings. He's not asking for experiences with God or manifestations. He's asking for, for the glory of God, to know God Himself. Moses cried, show me thy glory. He's pleading for revival. The prayer for revival is ultimately a prayer based upon a concern for the manifestation of the glory of God. And this can happen individually and collectively. Oh, listen, we've got to want this. We've got to cry for this, this glory. God wants His glory in the earth. God wants to be manifest Himself in the earth. Right here, today, God wants to manifest Himself. And in essence, that's what revival is all about. It's a concern for the manifestation of the glory of God. We're like Moses in a way. We, uh, we know God's there. We, seen, we have seen the stirrings of heaven all around us. And we know the terrible condition of the church and the lost world. And we too must pray for a manifestation of the glory of God among us. And the more we advance, the greater the desire for the glory of God to be revealed to us, the greater hunger for God himself. We've got to keep walking. We've got to keep stretching. We have to keep hungering and thirsting after God. Until we want nothing else but God. That's all. My goal is God himself. Not peace, not joy, not even blessing. But my goal is God. Show me thy glory. This brings us to the answer. And God tells Moses, in essence, yes, I'm going to answer your prayer, your petition, but I'm going to do it in my way. In verse 20, God says, Thou canst not see my face, for... There shall no man see me and live. And in verse 23, I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face 
shall not be seen. See, it's an amazing thing. We pray, we ask according to God's will. We beseech the throne of grace. We talk with God about matters. What we know that God has spoken to us about, God's been dealing with us about in our hearts and in our lives. And God says, yes, I'll answer your prayer, but I'll do it in my time and I'll do it in my way. Amazing. Amazing. Many people have asked God for healing. God says, I'll heal you, but I'll do it in my own time and I'll do it in my own way. And little did I know how God was going to heal Waldo Williams. I, I didn't know, and he hadn't know. He probably prayed, said, Lord, I'm in trouble. I need help. I got pain. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, touch me in some way. See, God says, I'll do it in my own time, and I'll do it in my own way. When the Lord stopped me, while I was exhorting and encouraging and preaching and revealed to me, I didn't. No one came up to me and said, you need to pray for Waldo. He's hurting in his legs. He didn't ask me to do it. The Lord talked to me about that and told me to stop now and pray for him in his legs. And God healed him. He couldn't sleep. Hadn't been able to sleep for six weeks. He had severe pain in his legs. He couldn't sleep very little in six weeks. Had to sit in a chair at night and, and uh, try to get some relaxation. He could not rest much. And I'm sure operations probably were awaiting him on his legs or his back or wherever. But oh my, God did it in his own time and in his own way. Just like Jim with his leg, God did it in his own time and in his own way. I've exhorted you, be where God is. There's a possibility God may touch you when he passes by. But I wouldn't want to be absent when God returns or God comes. I wouldn't want to be absent from the sanctuary. I wouldn't want to be absent from the place where God is working. Little did brother, this dear brother know up at the car wash. He, he didn't know he was going to be healed that way, but he'd been crying unto God. Lord, I need help. I need help. I need help. Little did he know it was going to happen that way. I didn't know. I didn't even realize, you know, the man was in, in problems, had problems. I didn't know he had pain. But the Lord told me to go by the car wash. He said, don't go to the other one, which I, I had preferred, did prefer don't go down there. Go here today. I said, I said, don't go down there. Go here today. Said, no, go here. We're a little bit like dogs or animals, you know. We had to, God has to, he said, no, no, don't do that. Go to here now. Go here. I said, Lord, is it, oh, no, go here now. Go here. I'm telling you, go here. Turn in here now. Okay. Jesus, I think I hear your voice here. Praise God. We are we're like little children. Don't do that. No, don't do that. Do this. I'm not saying go down there. Go here. This is not a punishment. Go here now. <laughs> I said, well, Lord. I said, you know, we might have opportunities to think, Lord, why are you punish, punishing me? I mean, why do, why do I have to go in here? I mean, <laughs> I want to go down there. Big babies, you know, I want to go down there. No, God says, no, don't do that now. Do this. This is not a punishment. This is, this is going to be a reward for somebody here. It's going to be a blessing to every person. So I heard the voice of God turned in. And he said, how are you today? I said, well, I'm looking to Jesus. He said, you're looking to the right man. I said, well, how are you? He said, well, I'll tell you, I'm in pain. Right away, Jesus talked to me. He told me in my heart. Right away. He said, you need to pray for the man. I wasn't personally acquainted with the man. The man wasn't acquainted with me. He didn't know who I was. And so I said, sir, can I pray for you? He said, yes, you can. Grabbed his hand and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed, be whole, be well. Said, amen. Went on through and didn't go back for about six weeks. One day the Lord said, go back now. So I went back. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. I said, what? Good to see you, sir. I said, what? How's that? Said, oh, he said, when you came here th through here last time, he said, you prayed for me. God did a great thing. He said, I went home. I told my companion, I want to tell you there's a man came through here today. I don't know who he was. I don't know where he was going. I don't know if he'll ever return. But I know one thing. He called to God and God healed me. 
God healed me. Brother, God took all the pain out of his legs. I'm here to tell you that man, that man believed in Jesus Christ, but he had been praying unto God. Oh God, help me. I'm in pain. My legs. Oh God, I need help in my legs. Help my legs. Lord. God got a hold of me one day and told me in my heart, go by, told a little servant to go by and pray for him. We never know how God's going to answer our prayers. A lot of our prayers are depending and hanging upon the fact that God's trying to talk to someone else and move on them in the power of the Spirit and help them to obey so God can help you and free you, release you, and help you to be obedient to God. There's a lot of people suffer that others may, may get right with God. There's people suffering today in families that other people in the family is not right with God and a member has to suffer and prevail and prevail with God and cry unto God and be under a heavy load and an awful burden when people don't obey God. Oh, if they'd hear God's voice. If they'd hear God's voice. He says, yes, I'll answer prayer, but it'll be in my time and be in my way. And no man's capable of standing with the full vision of God's glory. He says, you can't see me. I don't want you looking on my face. He could not bear it. It would kill him. Because of the inconceivable nature of the glory. There's no doubt, but most of us in our troubles as Christians begin with the fact that we are ignorant of God. And we're ignorant to the fact of God's greatness and God's hand of love and God's mercy to work things out in our lives, in our little world. We spend so much time in feeling our pulse. And taking our own spiritual temperature. Considering our moods and states and fears. We're living in the realm of self. Of the flesh. We don't think about the greatness and the mighty God of eternity. We don't think about that at all. We don't consider God's hand. We don't consider God's power. We're not considering the, the almightiness of God, the, the all-seeing eye of God, the all-powerful God. See, we're not considering these things. Oh, if we knew the power and the greatness of God, if we only knew. Amen. Tell you, these things, these things we're troubled about down here. I'll tell you, God can speak the word. Well, the Bible tells us He spoke the word, the word and the world was. He spoke the Word and we came into existence. The heavens were created. The earth was created. The Word out of the Word of His mouth. He just fell out of His mouth. Pow! And the universe became... You say, how in the world does that ever happen? My friends, it's too great for me to comprehend. All I know is what God's Word says. And I know when I tell you, God touches me. I know when I tell you that, brother, God witnesses to me that the Word fell out of His mouth. It fell out of His mouth. And the universe became, it came into existence. Brother, we don't know the power of the Word of God coming from the mouth of God. We, we don't realize the power. We're living in ignorance. Well, you take a look at what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah saw the Lord. God changed everything. Say, Lord, is there any hope for me? Isaiah, mighty, great, wonderful prophet of God. God helped me to preach 10 sermons in a row on Isaiah. I saw the Lord high lifted up. God helped me to preach 10 sermons. I'll tell you, the thoughts hit me so fast and furious that I couldn't, I couldn't contain it. I mean, over and over and over again, 10 sermons in a row. I had more and more and more and more, but the Lord finally told me to preach on something else. Praise God. I had more. I had more coming. I wasn't finished with the text. And the Lord just told me, he said, no, you need to stop there. Come back there someday. You need to stop right there. Come back and finish that someday when the church is more ready for this. 
I never got through. And most everything. I had, I had very few the things I ever read in a book. Very few thoughts I had ever written down in those 10 sermons. I mean, they were just coming. Power, glory, God was here. God was, oh, how wonderful God was helping. Amen. Four verses, I believe. Only four verses. Four verses. Only got through four verses. Yes. And God being my helper, I believe I could go back and preach maybe 10 sermons on, I saw the Lord. It's endless. God being my helper, it's endless. It's just on and on and on and on and on. And every time it would be different. Every time I would preach, it would be different. God had helped me to take a different angle. God had helped us to see something else right in there. I said, oh my, I didn't know this was in there, but here it is. Praise God forevermore. And so he saw the Lord, but God, God changed Isaiah. Oh, my God, put an anointing upon that man. He cleansed his lips. He cleansed his heart. He refined him in spirit. And you remember what happened to the apostle John fell at the feet as dead. Brother, we don't know. We don't know much about the glory of God. D.L. Moody was a strong man physically and very, a very sturdy man. And yet when God gave him a glimpse of his glory, he had to ask him to stop. He had to say, oh God, have mercy. Stay your hand. I can't stand any longer. You know why? Because he felt like he was going to die. He felt like his physical frame was actually cracking and breaking under the glory of God. God says, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So he tells Moses, I will give you just some indication of the glory. I will give you a fleeting glimpse of it, but you cannot see me as I am. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Do you know what revival is? Well, that's a perfect description. Revival is a glimpse of God. It's a glimpse of the glory of God passing by. Now that touches me. It's a glimpse of God passing by. Now when God passes by, His presence and His glory will remain for a long time when He really passes by. It's not like He walks by and that's it. God comes by, His presence can be felt for a long time. You see, what God's in, He's always in. And He remains behind. His presence does. And He never gets out of that. He's always locked into that. And so whatever God's ever done for you, you see, the effects of it still remain. Oh, I can remember when Jesus first saved me and everything was, not first saved me, but when he really got a hold of me the last time. Oh, his glory. His glory. It was everywhere. I mean, it was everywhere. 
It was the same with my wife. We saw the same things. I'm telling you, the glory of God was sparkling on the waters. The glory of God got on leaves. The glory of God was everywhere. It was in animals. The glory of God was on people. The glory, we saw the glory of God. It was everywhere. We wanted, we wanted the power to this glory, more of this glory, more of this love, more of this grace. It was so great. We see the effects of that thing are still working today here. The effects of it still going on. The, what God did there, it didn't end right there. Praise God. God still, He's still here in presence. He's still here and, 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 uh, His, His visitation is still with us. Amen. Yes, sir. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Yes. Now we need a greater demonstration here among all of us. We need a greater a sense of His presence and His glory. We, we need to sense that. We need to know that. Amen. I'll tell you, see, He's never left that. Just one thing he did for one person or two people. He never left that. It's God passing by. Praise God. I was telling how God helped me to pray for Mary. God passed by and Jesus touched Mary. She had one of her seizures and they called me and I went to pray and she was days coming out from underneath the seizure uh, before. Days. They said sometimes three and four days it would take for her to get back to normal. Uh, she had to rest a lot and sleep a lot. But I went out one day, had the phone call, went out. So I prayed for her and Jesus passed by. In fact, I asked the Lord to come through the door. Several family, family members, members were there, and I asked Jesus to come through the door, and he came through the door. And he turned and came this way. And I felt him brushed by me, and I laid his hand on her and touched her. And so I began to share, and she raised up off of the couch or sofa or whatever it was, and, and she was entering in and looked so bright-eyed and and happy and thrilled and backing me up in what I was saying and enjoying that the sisters ran over it with tears in her eyes, hugging her and rejoicing and praising God. And I didn't know it took her many days to get out from underneath this thing. I didn't realize it had that at all. All I knew was that Jesus passed by. I shared this one day. I was preaching down here and shared it one day and Jesus walked by again. And Brother Morris just about shouted. I don't know if I've ever seen him quite so happy. And he said, oh, I felt that. He said, Jesus passed by. Pastor, when you shared that, he's a kind of a quiet fella. He's kind of a real peaceful, restful, quiet person. And he said, Jesus just passed by. I was preaching one day on, she reached out and touched the helm of his garment. She spoke, the lady spoke within herself and said, if I can but touch the helm of his garment, I shall be made whole. God's presence was with us that morning. The next day I went over to Blacksburg to visit Estelle Fisher. And I said, oh, Estelle, let me tell you what, how God helped me to preach. She was weeping when I got there and I didn't realize why. But she, she told me, she said, Pastor, I want to tell you that, that they tell me I've got sugar diabetes or whatever. And she said, and a few other complications. And she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. She was, so, she was so afraid. She had broken her arm. Didn't even know if her arm would even heal up properly because of the, this uh, uh, high sugar content in her blood. And uh, so she said, uh, what am I going to do? I said, let me tell you what I preached yesterday. And I got to tell her about how the woman spoke within herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. And when I did, Jesus passed by. I said, Estelle, did you feel what I felt? I said, Jesus just passed by. She said, oh, praise God, I felt him, I felt him. I said, reach out and touch the helm of his garment. He will heal you right now. She reached out and touched him. The next time I came back, she said, praising God and thanking God. She said, oh, pastor, I'm healed. She said, I don't have that. They say, I don't have that. I'm healed. Praise God. Revival is when Jesus passes by and you get just a glimpse of his glory. Now remember, we can't look at him face to face. Just a glimpse of his glory. 
It's the touching of the hem of his garment. It's but a vision of the back, but, it's, but he's there. The very form and the person of God is in the place. You say, what is thunder and lightning? Well, according to the Bible, thunder and lightning are but a kind of indication of God's power. The God who said at the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. He gives you an indication of what his power is. The, the, the flash of lightning, the roar of thunder. These are but a glimpse of God's might, God's power, God's ability. Revival is just a touch of his glory. A fleeting glimpse of what he is in and of himself. It's meant for us. And we're not to be content with just a little request. Just a little experience. We need to see his glory. The counterpart to Exodus 33 is in the New Testament's found in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Paul says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. The hand is covering us now. And we, we are only seeing through a glass darkly. Yes, but we can see, thank God. We can see a little anyway, but we're seeing it. One day I, I, I know and I believe with all my heart it'll be face to face. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass... It's still only partial. It's beholding as in a kind of reflection from a mirror. Yes. But thank God we at least see that much. Beholding as in a glass. Well, what are we beholding? We're beholding the glory of the Lord. We're barely seen as in a glass or as in a mirror. We're seeing His glory. It's veiled somewhat. But thank God we're at least seeing a little. We're not getting the full weight of it just yet, but, but at least, praise God, we're at least we're touching maybe perhaps through belief the helm of his garment. Amen. Is that true of us? Can we honestly say with the Apostle Paul, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, we're to have a foretaste of glory divine. God wants us to have a little foretaste of His glory. John 17, 24 speaks about that. He says He's given us his glory. In this world, we're to have these partial disclosures until it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Do we know anything of these things? Well, what should I do about this? Do I really know what is going on here? Do I really understand these words? What, what, what can I do about this? What should I do about this? Charles Spurgeon said, I quote, we have the witness of the Spirit within, bearing witness with our spirits that we are born of God. There is such a thing on earth as an infallible assurance of our election. Let a man once get that and he will get, and it will anoint his head with fresh oil. It will clothe him with a white garment of praise and put the song of the angels in his mouth. Happy, happy man who is fully assured of his interest in the covenant, covenant of grace, in the blood of atonement, and in the glories of heaven. What would some of you give if you could arrive at this assurance? If you anxiously desire to know, you may know. If your heart pants to read its title clear, it shall do so ere long. No man ever desired Christ in his heart with a living and longing desire who did not find him sooner or later. If thou hast a desire, God has given it thee. If thou pantest and criest and groanest after Christ, even this is his gift. Bless him for it. Thank him for a little grace and ask him for great grace. End of quote. You see, these are the steps of Moses. Thank him for a little grace. And ask him for great grace. 
Oh, praise God. See, God's had mercy on you and me when he saved us. God had, God's had mercy on me many times in helping me get through situations. You know, even before I was ever converted, God had little grace on me. God delivered me from the hand of the enemy many times. God delivered me even from the hand of death several times. He's had grace on me. He's had enough grace to forgive me when I came to him and said, Jesus, I'm sorry, I've sinned. I've come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. I need you. Praise God, he gave me a little grace. Aren't you glad? Came to him, he said, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Praise God. Glory to God, a son has come home. A daughter has come home. Kill the fatty calf. Praise God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get the robe out here. Come on. Bring the robe out here. Praise God. Put a ring on her finger now. Glory to God, my son has come home. My son, my son. Oh, praise God. What wonderful words. My son has come home. One of the most wonderful, some of the most wonderful words in the New Testament. Oh, my son, my son, he's come home. Praise God. Some of the saddest words in the Old Testament. Oh, my son, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son. But some of the most glorious words. My son, he's come home. Praise the Lord. Put the shoes on his feet. Praise God. He's going to walk with me. Come on. Praise God. I got faith. He's going to, he's going to get them on. He's going to put the robes of righteousness on. Glory to God forevermore. He's had a little bit of grace. God's had a little bit of grace. I'll tell you, we need to be about the business of asking God for more grace. More of his glory. More of his love. Praise God forevermore. Well, this, this, this is the steps of Moses. God wants us to follow in his train. Yes. Amen. He's given us hope. Yes. Yes. We need to ask for faith. Yes. I'll tell you, he gave me hope when he saved me. Oh, from darkness into light that I might show forth the praises of him who had called me. Amen. Praise God. Hope, hope, hope. He gave me hope. But I've had to ask him for faith. He gave me a little faith. I had to ask him for some more. He's given me a little bit more. Now I'm asking God for some great faith. Because what God's called me to, to help get the church here in Parisburg ready, I want to tell you it's going to require great faith. A little bit of it's not going to get the job done. Brother, to get everyone clear with God, to get a body of believers walking under the banner of Jesus Christ and walking in, in holiness before God and doing God's will and following in His train, I want you to know it's going to require great faith for God to be able to bring us to oneness. Amen. That's going to require some faith because you're going to fall every now and then and this is going to fall and that one's going to be depressed and that one's going to be oppressed and there'll be all kinds of hardships and conflicts and trials and afflictions that'll come but it'll require some great faith. So I'm asking God for some great faith. Amen. When he gives you faith, you ask for assurance. And when you get assurance, you ask him for sanctification. And when you ask him for sanctification, ask for enjoyment. And when you get enjoyment, you ask for his glory. I want to tell you, he will surely give it unto you if you walk with him step by step and obey him in Jesus Christ. Are you on these steps? Having thanked God for what you have, have you gone deeper with God? And ask Him to help you to climb one more step. You say, what am I to do next? Take the next step with Jesus. Say, I don't know what to do, Pastor. 
I don't know where to go or where to turn. Wait upon the Lord and let God reveal himself and take the next step toward Christ and with Christ. It's a deeper walk. It's a step of faith. All you have to do is take one more that's all. Follow the example of Moses who through faith obtained the promises of God. Enter in boldly at the throne of grace and ask God to help you to take that next step. One step at a time. Until you reach that glorious place where you can say, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. That's revival. What would happen if we had five people that could really pray that prayer sincerely and honestly and have a hearing in heaven? Oh, God, show me that glory. You can't pray that if you're carnal. You can't pray that if you've been unfaithful to God. You can't be, pray that if you've walked on his promises and stomped in his, on his love. You can't pray it. But remember now, God's mercies to forgive you and help you to walk with him day by day, one step at a time, till you can grow to the point, to the place where you get past the experience. And you get past the blessing to the place where you can truly pray, Oh God, show me yourself. Show me your glory. Yes, I know it's just a glimpse. But Lord, let me see your glory. Let me see revival in my day. Oh God, walk by, walk by, and our midst pass by. Oh God. God's word says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Seek God for himself, for his glory. Pray for revival in your heart and for the church, for the passing by of the glory of God. Shall we stand? Oh, Father, we thank you. Thank you this morning for the preaching of the word. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the promises. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you, Lord, for the exhortation. Thank you that there's life in it, oh God, and that this is the way of gladness and the way of joy. Praise God forevermore. You want us all to enter in, Lord, to go out at the tent of meeting and wait there upon God and pray and seek your face and get clear and get clean as the disciples did there in the, on the day of Pentecost in the upper room as they waited together. Oh, God, help your people here in this place. They'll hunger and thirst after the living God as never before. So, Lord, we can keep walking with you and going one step at a time until we can reach that place. We can truly cry for revival by praying, oh, God, show me thy glory. Praise God forevermore. So help us, Lord. We need your help and your strength and your life within our hearts and our lives. We bless you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Praise God.